Imagine you're asleep early one morning and a thin, frail girl turns to you in your dream. Her ebony skin is so paper thin you can see every last vein and maggot through it. Her milky eyes are too dry to summon tears and somewhere from deep within her she manages the strength to utter her dying breath. I know you can hear me. Please, why won't you stop this? For a moment, you feel every instant of pain, misery, hunger, thirst and despair that this miserable little child has experienced for all of her seven short years. You wake with a start, haunted by the vision of this girl for the rest of the day. You can barely concentrate on your work. Your manager yells at you, then drags you into his office to berate you more thoroughly. As you make eye contact, you suddenly see him at age eight, crying, naked from the waist down, being beaten savagely by his father for not being man enough. He turns to you in this weird vision you're having and says, I know you can hear me. Please, why won't you stop this? You try to snap out of it, but for the next 36 agonising years, you're forced to endure every moment of shame and wretched self-doubt that this miserable assistant manager's lot in life. At every point, he turns to you, sometimes screaming, sometimes begging, sometimes crying, and says the same words over and over. You blink, less than a second has passed, your manager doesn't even bother to notice. You step out of his office, but as you do, your eyes meet the secretary's. Every moment of shame, humiliation and depression of her life come flooding into you. I know you can hear me. Please, why won't you stop this? It's like this all the time now. At first it was only the people you met. People you saw on television. People you saw on billboards. Then it branched out. Something has expanded in your awareness. You can count them with a clarity that your old mind could never have managed. Seven billion souls, all screaming their desperate prayers to you. Prayers for release. For the first few months, all you can do to keep them going mad. You try to kill yourself, twice. Failed both times. Something keeps pulling you back, telling you, no, not yet. You have work to do. That's when it really started getting fucked up. Seven billion souls expanded to twelve, then to thirty. 30 billion screaming, crying humans, most of them in strange garb speaking strange tongues, but you can understand it. The collective misery of every human that has ever lived, as they beg and plead with you, you can't understand what you're supposed to do about it. Most of these people are already dead, their misery has already happened, but what are you supposed to do about that? Most of the time, you're a bloody mess. You cut yourself regularly, just to be able to focus on your own body your own sensations. Pleasure is impossible. You are literally a conduit for all the misery and despair that has ever existed. All the pain and fear that has ever been experienced by a human soul. The next change happened at mealtime. For a brief moment, you experience the horror of what it is to be a factory farm chicken. In a flash, you experience the suffering and torment of an entire battery of factory farm chickens. The enormity of it floors you. Cows, pigs, the occasional rat. Soon your consciousness expands beyond human prey animals to encompass the entire scope of evolutionary history. Every being that died in the grand pageant of evolution, every screaming, pleading neuron that flickered and failed because it was insignificantly adapted to its environment. You cannot conceive of how your mind is capable of processing this, let alone staying sane. You laugh bitterly at the thought. None of your behaviours have been remotely sane for over a year. But what the hell are you supposed to do? We aren't just talking about human suffering anymore. We're talking about the suffering of the universe. Throughout time. Since the beginning. There needs to have never been a beginning. Destroying someone's hope is the greatest gift you can give them. Most of the so-called awakened are in serious denial. Every mage gets a glimpse of the mad and arbitrary nature of reality when they awaken. That's what awakening is, after all. But most of them cling to the idea that, even if the laws of physics are nonsense, concepts like compassion and justice and enlightenment still have some sort of meaning. Some, like the technocracy, think they can impose meaning on a meaningless universe. Others think they can achieve some kind of happiness by coming to terms with the transitory nature of all things. They all believe, in one way or another, that it's somehow possible to make existence bearable. Or at least to retain some kind of dignity in the face of an indifferent cosmos. They proudly call themselves will workers. 
as if individual will were anything more than a sick joke. Those who have been through the calls, however, can no longer cling to such comforting fantasies. The calls force mages to confront the fact that hope is a blasphemy, a cowardly and self-serving denial of the fundamental nature of reality. The calls expose all ideas and all philosophies as insane charades. In the calls, a mage sees herself as she truly is, an idiot child, heaping shit on her head and claiming it's the golden crown of the world. The shame of realising her own self-degradation and rage at the useless lies that keep humanity from the peace of oblivion destroy the last of her illusions. When she emerges, she sees the world clearly for the horror it is. The Nymphandi don't commit atrocities for fun, although many of them do take a certain grim pleasure in their work. When they torture and rape and mutilate, they do it to tear down the great lie that it's okay to hope that trying to make yourself or others happy is a worthy goal rather than insane hubris. Destroying individual souls isn't enough though. The great torture wheel of the universe is kept in motion by the hope that if it just keeps spinning long enough, things will get better. The Nymphandis seek to create hell on earth in order to destroy that hope and to convince the mass of sleepers that their only salvation lies in oblivion then the whole vast edifice of reality will come tumbling down and all the creatures will, at last, be freed from the burden of existence. The original story ends here, but several posts later. And here's where I take over. You cannot conceive of how your mind is capable of processing this, let alone staying sane. You laugh bitterly at the thought. None of your behaviours have been remotely sane for over a year. But what the hell are you supposed to do? And then one day, something changes. You come across a creature that has never truly suffered. A young man, simple enough, quiet, average, as you once were, and in the space where only pain and heartbreak grow like weeds in most, you find something strange, something that you've never touched before. You see, as he quietly wanders through life helping others, believing foolishly that they would do the same for him, that the world is just naive as a newborn, he helps an old woman who was once a whore, Cross the street, and the tiny place within him grows, as the old woman thanks him, seeing his own deed fulfilled in some tiny way, strengthening his belief in the basic, fundamental goodness in man. For just a moment, you stare into this man, seeing nothing but kindness, integrity and honest, human compassion, simple and pure as a flame, as beautiful in comparison to the evils in the hearts of most, as a king's garden in the comparison to a landfill and your cheeks are wet, but you don't remember starting to cry. The lorry comes from nowhere. You glance into the driver's eyes and see he drinks because of what his wife does when he's away from home. The young man sees him coming too, spry, young, athletic. He could dive out of the way. Instead, the old woman is pushed out of the path of the lorry, the young man shattering as he hits the hood, that golden place inside him darkening with fear and pain. As his decimated body bending itself around a lamppost in the most horrific manner, mere metres from you, and something inside you breaks, an empathy that coated you, making you see the suffering of others but never doing anything about it. You charge on him in moments, rushing to his aid, blood smearing his shattered features and his body is broken in more ways than one. Up close you realise that he can't be more than 14 or 15 at the outmost that in some ways he can't even begin to understand what he did. And yet, he still did it. That place within him is untainted, growing but filled with fear. He croaks out three tiny words. Is she okay? You nod. The old woman is already calling an ambulance. The others crowd round, wanting to witness an accident, their morbid curiosity and the suffering of others. A natural human thing. As base and primal as fucking. But inside the man... The fear clears, and suddenly, as if seeing a painting from a different angle, under all the pain and suffering, dotted amongst the crowd, you see gold, shining through, a plant choked, but not dead, for all the weeds of shame and pain that shares its garden. His fear for the woman, not for his own life, as if he literally cannot comprehend that he is dying. The pain is so great that shock has set in, his hands cold as you hold it. Their fear for his life. Their hope that he survives and their awe at his bravery. As you see their own fears crumble, his bravery giving them permission for their own light to shine through. 
and somewhere inside you, you scramble, praying for some way, some way to save this beautiful, hopeless, wonderful creature, this innocent. And somewhere inside you, the music responds, roused from the slumber of apathy by your will and urging. It comes from inside you, as much as a part of you as hope, or love, or pain. And the golden fire from your own compassion shines through, pouring from your body, hand-holding his, showing him that there are others like him, that even if you don't know it, there is good in you. Gathering on the hope of the crowd, it rushes downhill, from your own unknown and unobservant mountain of kindness, and into him, flesh unrenting, bones unshattering, pain banished before the coming light, taken into yourself, but endurable, if it means that this humble average man will live. And for you, the entire street is awash in golden fire and harmony, and something greater than a thousand deaths as these people witness a miracle, begin to hope again that their own pains are washed away in the flood of your nature. You never saw that man again, after the paramedics arrived, and no official report tells of how a man hit by a lorry was totally unharmed. You held his hand until he told you that if you weren't family, you couldn't come in the ambulance, and through the darkness and pain returned in all who seen what happened. In some it was less, and in some there was room for hope to grow and kindness to begin its song, and you remember the music. It sang of justice and truth and mercy, the temporary nature of good and the fallibility of evil, of hope, of love, of all things good about man, and how these things were worth sacrifice, how you would bring them to others, even if it was just for a moment, even if it was just until evil equalised the playing field, as evil always does, and for a mere moment, you knew what it was, you know that you were loved like no other, had been given a gift like no other. How you would rid the world of some small part of its darkness, redeem those who could, bring the fury of the meek and innocent to those who brought suffering to others, to be offered the chance to stand before the ever-present darkness, your body ablaze and scream to the vile things that lurked in the sticky black corners of the human soul, that this would not suffice, that these people were not theirs, and that you would battle them, step for step, for the soul and happiness of each one, and it sang of others' things as well. Things that have no words, in this or any language. Things that cannot be explained. Things that drove you to fury. Things that drove you to weep. Things that drove you to quit your job, take up the blade and march into the shadows. Years ago, never to be seen again. Things that, as the woman who will be your squire, lies before you and you reach out, touching her slashed wrists, bringing her back to this world, to her visions to all that is, in its darkness and its glory, its pain and its redemption, you know that she will hear too, when the music touches her. Things that will drive her to the same cause as you, for the music only touches those it knows, holds in them the strength to endure, in this flawed world, those who will find within themselves the strength to carry the burden of all and who will one day die. But their legend will endure, inspiring others as only legends, not people can. Things that only the music can speak of, to those who will listen. Things that made it all the pain, all the suffering, all the agony of this world nothing before them. That made this place worth the battle, worth the war, worth every one of your kind that marched to what most would consider a meaningless death. The battle that lasted since the dawn of time. A meat grinder from which none of you could escape and that you knew was worth it. Worth your life. One day. And it would be worth hers if she chose to follow the course, as you knew she would, things that only a paladin could understand. Paladins in World of Darkness, brought to see the world as it truly is, your kind burn with an inner fire, where most are oil lamps, you are fireworks, shooting across the sky, eliminating all who see you, if only for a briefest time, taking some small moat of the darkness from the world when you explode. The fire within unleashed, consuming you, even as it saves all who see you, touched by a benevolent but alien and possibly eldritch abomination, force only known as the music. The truth of the world around you drives you to great deeds. You take up arms and blaze with a life of compassion to burn yourself alive so that others may have a guiding light to see by, even if your quest is ultimately futile. Paladin, the redemption, I can fap to this.
<laughs> well, I don't know about you guys, but I really enjoyed it, and it's something really different from what we used to do. And yeah, like you know, I really enjoyed reading it. Yeah, it and was I something a bit more serious. While I was reading it. Yeah, it was. It was a lot more fun. It was a lot more serious, and it has a different feel or tone to it. You know, and um, when it comes to paladins, like you know, people play them a few different ways. I always end up going like you know the religious fundamentalist sort. Yeah, you know, like the crazy mental like you know think of like the uh, hardcore bible bash and like, Ian Peasley Ian Peasley if any of you guys don't know who Ian Peasley is giggle him <laughs> he's absolute a paladin. Uh, absolute paladin fire and brimstone <laughs> yeah definitely fire and brimstone type old preacher yeah. of sorts um, but no like, let us know what you thought if you guys want something more akin to this down the road like something like something a bit more serious or yeah, you know, we can try and find other stories to like this, you know. Up. And it's nice to do stuff different from time to time, you know. I enjoyed it anyway. So, like as always, guys, let us know what you thought down below, and we'll see you in the next video. Bye. Oh.